Good afternoon, Mr. Arnold Bonhomme. Well, good afternoon. Your story of Fred Douglas is such a fine story and a true story. You must have been reading about him and studying about his life, though, for a long time before that, weren't you? Yes, I had. I had read his autobiography. He wrote a very impressive autobiography. And uh, actually, he wrote it three times during his life. All three of them interesting, all three different, at uh, different periods of mm -hmm. his life. And these had uh, sort of fed my interest and stimulated further reading. Were there other sources other than this? Well, yes, I would say there were other books on the Negro in American history during the 19th century. And all of these touched on matters that were that concerned Frederick Douglass. He was he was a dominating character, an outstanding figure, uh, certainly as well known in his day as Martin Luther King is today, more so perhaps. Mm -hmm. He was also an attractive personality, so that when, uh, uh, well, Lincoln called on him several times as a consultant, and he was asked to help recruit Negro soldiers during the Civil War. He did by first recruiting his own two sons. And after Lincoln's assassination, the city of Rochester made him its chief mourner when uh, at one of the first important memorials of Lincoln's death when the casket passed through Rochester. So he was certainly not overlooked in his time in uh, your hundred years of Negro freedom, you speak about what, uh, how intelligent he was and what a brilliant man he was, even more so probably than Booker T. Washington. And yet Booker T. Washington is better known, isn't he? Yes, that's right. You see, uh, after the Civil War, we had a period, the period of Reconstruction, in which uh, there was a real problem of trying to uh, allay the bitterness that had been caused by the war. And during that period, Frederick Douglass was remembered as a great agitator and as a great man who helped to bring about the conflict to, in order to uh, bring about the end of slavery. So uh, there was a tendency on the part of everybody to let bygones be bygones and try to forget the conflict. And so Frederick Douglass uh, was was played down. But history, you know, has a way of repeating itself. Time is not a river, it is, it's a pendulum. And we have come back now to Douglass's time, and Douglass means more to young people today than Booker Washington. Booker Washington is, in, is now in eclipse because we are no longer in a period of compromise. Well, wasn't Douglass that said uh leave us alone and give us a fair chance, but be sure you give us a chance. That, that's that's the kind of talk that Douglas mm -hmm. was uh, was noted for. Mm -hmm. He was uh, he, he was very wise. Douglas was so wise, in fact, and so so brilliant that five years after he had run away from slavery, when he made his first public speeches, the boys at Harvard wouldn't believe that he'd ever been a slave, and they accused him of being an imposter. Uh, they said, this is just an educated man who has as much general knowledge as we have, but uh, he's uh, masquerading as a slave in order to attract attention. So Douglas had to go into seclusion one summer and write the first edition of his autobiography. Well, when he did this, uh, he unintentionally revealed who he was, who his master was, and uh, this was in the days still of slavery, so that his master said, well, fine, that's just what I've been trying to find out, where the, what became of my boy. And he uh, set out through uh, with the slave catchers to find him and sent up to New England to catch Douglas. So Douglas had to run away to England, and sta he stayed abroad two years. But during this time... He, his fame grew. This was really the period of his greatest uh, uh, acclaim because he lectured some 2,000 times in England and he aroused the British uh, against slavery. Before the Civil War broke out, he returned. But he returned because some British friends decided to pay off his master and make it possible for him to carry on his anti-slavery work. So they, they paid him off.
Well, you mentioned several times that he talked nice uh, in this in the story. Now, this is what you mean that he talked. Uh, he was had an educated way about talking. He did have a very a, a very fine way of speaking. I, I do mean that. Even as a even as a slave, before he ran away from Baltimore, uh, he used to, uh, when on days off, go into the city to, to places where the young people were having uh, discussions and participate with them. He had a great faith and belief in the spoken word as well as in the written word, and he became a master of both. And this is one of our questions. If he hadn't been to school... Why do you think he talked so well? Well, I think uh, he taught himself, you know. The story, uh, which I tell in, in my book, of how he taught himself to read is an illustration. When his master hired him out as a ship builder, uh, in, that is, in a shipyard, mm -hmm. to do what he could. <clears throat> and Douglas found out that some of, the, some of the pieces in the ship were marked, and he had to read the markings. So he learned, he, he did that. Then on the way back and forth from his employment, he met white boys who had been to school and who were carrying books, and he persuaded them to let him read their books or to, sh to tell them, to tell him first what certain of the characters stood for. In this way, he taught himself the rudiments of reading. In your story about Fred Douglas, you tell about the fact that uh, his master didn't want him to be taught to read because it would spoil him. Now, what did you mean by this? Well, I, I think that the, the feeling of most slave owners was that uh, knowledge of reading uh, disqualifies a slave for, his, for being a slave. For once one learned to read and write, he read about the principles of democracy and he began to question the institution of slavery itself, most, so that most of the, of the people who revolted against slavery were those who had learned reading and writing. Yeah. Actually, when slavery was first introduced in the United States in the colonial period, before George Washington, all slaves were permitted to learn, and many of them developed uh, uh, high skills but this led to rebellion. This led to their reading about the French Revolution. It le led to their reading about the Haitian insurrections. Mm -hmm. And the result was that most uh, slave owners uh, reached the conclusion that they were safer and their property was safer <laughs> if, they, if they kept away from the slave the mm -hmm. knowledge of reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Well, he was very smart to run away, and very smart the way he planned it, he thought. That's right. He, uh, he, he did not succeed in his first attempt, mm -hmm. but later he made it good. Why did Frederick Stein, the German blacksmith, smile at Fred Douglas when he was running away? Well, we can only make some assumptions there. In Frederick Douglass's autobiography, he, he mentioned that he recognized Stein, that he was sure Stein recognized him. But he felt that Stein knew what was happening and that he had enough sympathy for Douglas in his condition to at least keep still and let him get away if he could. Well, then, what did you mean in the chapter on the slave breaker when you said that the long night of slavery was falling? Well, if you think of the time at which this was written, history will show that the agitation against slavery was getting more intense at that period. Uh, the, the idea of a slave breaker was widespread uh, in the South. Uh, you see, the Underground Railroad was uh, operating, and there were all sorts of movements toward the emancipation of slaves. Many people who disapproved of slavery took the position that the way the slave could help himself was to run away or mm -hmm. to, to use his own efforts to try to get free. The need then to uh, break slaves, as they used to say, to keep them from uh, cooking up any uh, rebellious actions was one that seemed important. And that's why men uh, who, who served in this capacity were highly regarded. 
But Douglas happened to pick a time when he could get away with that, fighting his the breaker, because the breaker, uh, if, if it was discovered that the slave breaker could no longer break slaves, his occupation was in danger. He's supposed to win those encounters. <laughs> and, uh, well, Douglas uh, wouldn't have it that way. And the fact that slavery was coming to, the, uh, to an end, in other words. Uh, slavery was uh, uh, coming to, to an end. It was coming to a head, at least to a decision. Well, it's a good book, and we're glad you wrote it. Now, are you going to write any more uh, similar to this one about um, famous Negroes? Well, I do intend to write others. I've never been one to write books that are similar. If you look at my books, you'll find that each time I take a new turn. I have written one on George Washington Carver, which is very different, but it's a biographical. And I have uh, another, a new one that is uh, quite different, that I hope will be published probably in 19... Uh, 69, called Three Pennies for Luck. Uh, th this is a, a story based on something in my own experience, uh, and it's uh, it's it's not too serious, but it uh, uh, well, I enjoyed writing it. That's about all I can say about it until it's published. Mm -hmm. Well, then the famous uh, Negro athlete that you wrote is very good. Um, was it hard to pick uh, the nine athletes that you did? Well, yes, it was. I, I spent quite a little time selecting uh, nine uh, who stood out because I wanted to represent the several sports, uh, and I wanted also to give some impression of their periods, their times. Mm -hmm. So I had to get a beginning and an end, and I wanted very much to get a woman in there, I included uh, Althea Gibson, mm -hmm. who is a good one. How did you get the material for these stories? Did you see the people in person? In some cases, I saw the people in person. Uh, but m mainly I relied on the records mm -hmm. and on the newspaper accounts and for and, and other written sources. Uh, the story about Jim Brown and how he felt about uh, the fox and the rooster story from Chaucer. Was this something that you read somewhere, or did he uh, it? I talked to Jim Brown, mm -hmm. but I also found an allusion to this in something that appeared in uh, Sports Illustrated. Uh, it was interesting that so many of the famous athletes uh, came from very poor families and worked very hard to succeed, but there always seemed to be someone who helped them at the right time that you uh, brought out. Yes, I think that's absolutely necessary. Boys or girls from deprived families, from families that don't have enough, have a great incentive to achieve, so that gives them their original push. But uh, it's also true that no one can do it all on his own. He has to have help. Mm -hmm. And even an athlete who has most of what he needs built in needs some uh, assistance, either by as a, an instructor or a person to pave the way. I think that in the case of each of these athletes, you'll find that he, he got the help he needed at a crucial time. So many of them became baseball stars, too, didn't they? Yes, that's right. Several did. Uh, baseball represents a field which has not been open to Negroes in the, in the best or biggest sense all the time. Mm -hmm. Originally, Negroes played baseball among themselves and had little leagues of their own, but they were not included in major league play. And they ins aspired to do that because that's, uh, that's where the finest baseball is played and that's where the, where the earnings are best. And it was a long, hard, and rocky road for them to reach the point where they would be included. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those included that I wrote about was Satchel Paige, who, whose career was mainly made before Negroes were permitted in Major League Baseball. He happened to pitch for so long that after Jackie Robinson had broken the door down and opened it up, so to speak, with the help of Branch Rickey, they went back and found some of these uh, 
these gifted old unsung players uh, who had spent their lives in Negro baseball. Mm -hmm. And Satchel Paige was a good illustration. Well, Mr. Von Thompson, it's certainly been most interesting talking about your book. Well, thank you. A pleasure. We'll be enjoying this along with your book. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much. <laughs>